Book Two of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo, Siege and Storm. Chapter Eight. The moment we entered the unsea, I knew something had changed. Hurriedly, I braced my feet against the deck and threw up my hands, casting a wide golden swath of sunlight around the hummingbird. As angry as I was with Sturmhond, I wasn't going to let a flock of Volcro bring us down only to prove a point. With the power of both amplifiers, I barely had to think to summon the light. I tested its edges carefully, sensing none of the wild disruption that had overcome me the first time I'd used the fetter. But something was very wrong. The fold felt different. I told myself it was just imagination, but it seemed like the darkness had a texture. I could almost feel it moving over my skin. The edges of the wound at my shoulder began to itch and pull, as if the flesh were restless. I'd been on the unsea twice before, and both times I'd felt like a stranger, like a vulnerable interloper in a dangerous, unnatural world that did not want me there. But now it was as if the fold was reaching out to me, welcoming me. I knew it made no sense. The fold was a dead and empty place, not a living thing. It knows me, I thought. Light calls to light. I was being ridiculous. I cleared my head and thrust the light out farther, letting the power pulse warm and reassuring around me. This was what I was, not the darkness. They're coming, Mal said beside me. Listen. Over the rush of the wind, I heard a cry echo through the fold, and then the steady pounding of Volcro wings. They'd found us quickly, drawn by the smell of human prey. Their wings beat the air around the circle of light I'd created, pushing the darkness back at us in fluttering ripples. With crossings of the fold at a standstill, they'd been too long without food. Appetite made them bold. I spread my arms, letting the light bloom brighter, driving them back. No, said Sturmhond. Bring them closer. What? Why? I asked. The Volcro were pure predators. They weren't to be toyed with. They hunt us, he said, raising his voice so everyone could hear him. Maybe it's time we hunted them. A warlike whoop went up from the crew, followed by a series of barks and howls. Pull back the light, Sturmhond told me. He's out of his mind, I said to Mal. Tell him he's out of his mind. But Mal hesitated. Well... Well, what? I asked incredulously. In case you've forgotten, one of those things tried to eat you. He shrugged, and a grin touched his lips. Maybe that's why I'd like to see what those guns can do. I shook my head. I didn't like this. Any of it. Just for a moment, pressed Sturmhond. Indulge me. Indulge him? Like he was asking for another slice of cake. The crew was waiting. Toya and Tamar were hunched over the protruding barrels of their guns. They looked like leather-backed insects. All right, I said, but don't say I didn't warn you. Mal lifted his rifle to his shoulder. Here we go, I muttered. I curled my fingers. The circle of light contracted, shrinking around the ship. The Volcra shrieked in excitement. All the way, commanded Sturmhond. I gritted my teeth in frustration, then did as he asked. The fold went dark. I heard a rustle of wings. The Volcra dove. Now, Alina, Sturmhond shouted. Throw it wide. I didn't stop to think. I cast the light out in a blazing wave. It showed the horror surrounding us in the harsh, unforgiving light of a noonday sun. There were Volcra everywhere, suspended in the air around the ship, a mass of gray, winged, writhing bodies, milky, sightless eyes, and jaws crowded with teeth. Their resemblance to the Nichevoya was unmistakable, and yet they were so much more grotesque, so much more clumsy. Fire! shouted Sturmhan. Toya and Tamar opened fire. It was a sound I'd never heard, a relentless, skull-shattering thunder that shook the air around us and rattled my bones. It was a massacre. The Volcra plummeted from the skies around us, chests blown open, wings torn from their bodies. The spin cartridges pinged to the deck of the ship. The sharp burn of gunpowder filled the air. Two hundred rounds per minute, so that was what a modern army could do. The monsters didn't seem to know what was happening. They whirled and beat the air, driven into a tizzy of bloodlust, hunger, and fear, tearing at each other in their confusion and desire to escape. Their screams. Bagra had once told me that the Volker's ancestors were human. I could have sworn I heard it in their cries. The gunfire died away. My ears rang. I looked up and saw smears of black blood and bits of flesh on the canvas sails. A cold sweat had broken out over my brow. I thought I might be ill. The quiet lasted only moments before Toyo threw back his head and gave a triumphant howl. The rest of the crew joined in, barking and yapping. I wanted to scream at all of them to shut up. Do you think we can draw another flock? One of the squallers asked. Maybe, Sturmhan said, but we should probably head east. It's almost dawn and I don't want us to be spotted. Yes, I thought. Let's head east. Let's get out of here. My hand shook. The wound at my shoulder burned and throbbed. What was wrong with me? The Volcro were monsters. They would have torn us apart without a thought. I knew that, and yet I could still hear their cries. There are more of them, Mal said suddenly. A lot more. How do you know? asked Sturmhond. I just do. Sturmhond hesitated. Between the goggles, his hat, and the high collar, it was impossible to read his expression. Where? he said finally. Just a little north, Mal said. That way. 
He pointed into the dark, and I had the urge to slap his hand. Just because he could track the Volcra didn't mean he had to. Sturmhorn called the bearing. My heart sang. The hummingbird dipped its wings and turned as Mal called out directions and Sturmhorn corrected our course. I tried to focus on the light, on the comforting presence of my power, tried to ignore the sick feeling in my gut. Sturmhorn took us lower. My light shimmered over the fold's colorless sand and touched the shadowy bulk of a wrecked sand skiff. A tremor passed through me as we drew closer. The skiff had been broken in half. One of its masts had snapped in two, and I could just make out the remnants of three ragged black sails. Mal had led us to the ruins of the darkling skiff. The little bit of calm I'd managed to pull together vanished. The hummingbird sank lower. Our shadow passed over the splintered deck. I felt the tiniest bit of relief. Illogical as it was, I'd expected to see the bodies of the Grisha I'd left behind spread out on the deck, the skeletons of the king's emissary and the foreign ambassadors huddled in a corner. But of course they were long gone, food for the Volcra, their bones scattered over the barren reaches of the fold. The hummingbird banked starboard. My light pierced the murky depths of the broken hull. The screams began. Saints, Mal swore, and raised his rifle. Three large Volcra cringed beneath the skiff's hull, their backs to us, their wings spread wide but it was what they were trying to shield with their bodies that sent a spike of fear and revulsion quaking through me. A sea of wriggling, twisted shapes, tiny, glistening arms, little backs split by the transparent membranes of barely formed wings. They mewled and whimpered, slithering over each other, trying to get away from the light. We'd uncovered a nest. The crew had gone silent. There was no barking or yapping now. Sturmhorn brought the ship around in another low arc. Then he shouted, Toya, Tamar, Granatki. The twins rolled out two cast-iron shells and hefted them to the edge of the rail. Another wave of dread washed over me. They're Volcra, I reminded myself. Look at them. They're monsters. Squallers, on my signal, Sturmhan said grimly. Fuses, he shouted. Then, gunners, drop heavy. The instant the shells were released, Sturmhan roared, Now! and cut the ship's wheel hard to the right. The squallers threw up their arms and the hummingbird shot skyward. A second passed, then a massive boom sounded beneath us. The heat and force of the explosion struck the hummingbird in a powerful gust. Steady, Sturmhan bellowed. The little craft foundered wildly, swinging like a pendulum beneath its canvas wings. Mal planted a hand to either side of me, shielding my body with his as I fought to keep my balance and hold the light alive around us. Finally, the ship stopped swaying and settled into a smooth arc, tracing a wide circle above the burning wreckage of the skiff. I was shaking hard. The air stank of charred flesh. My lungs felt singed, and each breath seared my chest. Sturmhan's crew were howling and barking again. Mal joined in, raising his rifle in the air in triumph. Above the cheering, I could hear the Volcra's screams, helpless and human to my ears, the keening of mothers mourning their young. I closed my eyes. It was all I could do to keep from clamping my hands to my ears and crumpling to the deck. Enough, I whispered. No one seemed to hear me. Please, I rasped. Mal, you've become quite the killer, Alina. The cool voice. My eyes flew open. The darkling stood before me, his black hefta rippling over the hummingbird's deck. I gasped and stepped back, staring wildly around me, but no one was watching. They were whooping and shouting, gazing down at the flames. Don't worry, the Darkling said gently. It gets easier with time. Here, I'll show you. He slid a knife from the sleeve of his kefta, and before I could cry out, he slashed toward my face. I threw my hands up to defend myself, a scream tearing loose from my throat. The light vanished, and the ship was plunged into darkness. I fell to my knees, huddling on the deck, ready to feel the piercing sting of Grisha steel. It didn't come. People were yelling in the darkness around me. Sturmhond was shouting my name. I heard the echoing shriek of a Volcra. Close. Too close. Someone wailed and the ship listed sharply. I heard the thump of boots as the crew scrambled to keep their footing. Alina! Mal's voice this time. I felt him fumbling toward me in the dark. Some bit of sense returned. I threw the light back up in a shining cascade. The Volcra that had descended upon us yelled and wheeled back into the darkness, but one of the squalors lay bleeding on the deck, his arm nearly torn from its socket. The sail above him flapped uselessly. The hummingbird tilted, listing hard to starboard, rapidly losing altitude. Tamar, help him, Sturmhan ordered. But Toya and Tamar were already scrambling over the holes toward the down squalor. The other squalor had both hands raised, her face rigid with strain as she tried to summon a strong enough current to keep us aloft. The ship bobbled and wavered. Stormhan held fast to the wheel, yelling orders to the crewmen working the sails. My heart hammered. I looked frantically over the deck, torn between terror and confusion. I'd seen the Darkling. I'd seen him. Are you all right? Mal was asking beside me. Are you hurt? I couldn't look at him. I shook so badly I thought I might fly apart. I focused all my effort on keeping the light blazing around us. Is she injured? shouted Stormhond. Just get us out of here, Mal replied. Oh, is that what I should be trying to do? Stormhond barked back. The Volcro were shrieking and whirling, beating at the circle of light. 
Monsters they might be, but I wondered if they understood vengeance. The hummingbird rocked and shuddered. I looked down and saw Grey Sands rushing up to meet us. And then suddenly we were out of the darkness, bursting through the last black wisps of the folds as we shot into the blue light of early dawn. The ground loomed terrifyingly close beneath us. Lights out, Sturmhan commanded. I dropped my hands and took desperate hold of the cockpit's rail. I could see a long stretch of road, a town's lights glowing in the distance, and there, beyond a low rise of hills, a slender blue lake, morning light glinting off its surface. Just a little farther, cried Sturmhan. The squalor let out a sob of effort, her arms trembling. The sails dipped. The hummingbird continued to fall. Branches scraped the hull as we skimmed the treetops. Everyone get low and hold tight, shouted Sturmhan. Mal and I hunkered down into the cockpit, arms and legs braced against the sides, hands clasped. The little ship rattled and shook. We aren't going to make it, I rasped. He said nothing, just squeezed my fingers tighter. Get ready, Sturmhan roared. At the last second, he hurled himself into the cockpit in a tangle of limbs. He just had time to say, this is cozy, before we struck land with a bone-shattering jolt. Mal and I were thrown into the nose of the cockpit as the ship tore into the ground, clattering and banging, its hull splintering apart. There was a loud splash, and suddenly we were skimming across the water. I heard a terrible wrenching sound and knew that one of the hulls had broken free. We bounced roughly over the surface and then miraculously shuddered to a halt. I tried to get my bearings. I was on my back, pressed up against the side of the cockpit. Someone was breathing hard beside me. I shifted gingerly. I'd taken a hard knock to the head and cut open both of my palms, but I seemed to be in one piece. Water was flooding in through the cockpit's floor. I heard splashing, people calling to one another. Mal, I ventured, my voice a quavery squeak. I'm okay, he replied. He was somewhere to my left. We need to get out of here. I peered around, but Sturmhan was nowhere to be seen. As we clambered out of the cockpit, the broken ship began to tilt alarmingly. We heard a creaking sigh, and one of the masts gave way, collapsing into the lake beneath the weight of its sails. We threw ourselves into the water, kicking hard as the lake tried to swallow us along with the ship. One of the crewmen was tangled in the ropes. Mal dove down to extricate him, and I nearly wept with relief when they both broke the surface. I saw Toya and Tamar paddling free, followed by the other crewmen. Toya had the wounded squalor in tow. Sturmhan swam behind him, supporting an unconscious sailor beneath his arm. We made for the shore. My bruised limbs felt heavy, weighted down by my sodden clothes, but we finally reached the shallows. We hauled ourselves out of the water, slogging through patches of slimy reeds, and threw our bodies down on the wide crescent of the beach. I lay there, panting, listening to the oddly ordinary sounds of early morning. Crickets in the grass, birds calling from somewhere in the woods, a frog's low, tentative croak. Toya was ministering to the injured squalor, finishing the business of healing his arm, instructing him to flex his fingers, bend his elbow. I heard Sturmhan come ashore and hand the last sailor into Tamar's care. He's not breathing, Sturmhan said, and I don't feel a pulse. I forced myself to sit up. The sun was rising behind us, warming my back, gilding the lake and the edges of the trees. Tamar had her hands pressed to the sailor's chest, using her power to draw the water from his lungs and drive life back into his heart. The minute seemed to stretch as the sailor lay motionless on the sand. Then he gasped. His eyes fluttered open and he spewed lake water over his shirt. I heaved a sigh of relief. One less death on my conscience. Another crewman was clutching his side, testing to see if he'd broken any ribs. Mal had a nasty gash across his forehead. But we were all there. We'd made it. Sturmhan waded back into the water. He stood knee-deep in it, contemplating the smooth surface of the lake, his great coat pulling out behind him. Other than a torn-up stretch of earth along the shore, there was no sign that the hummingbird had ever been. The uninjured squalor turned on me. What happened back there, she spat. Kovu was almost killed. We all were. I don't know, I said, resting my head against my knees. Mal drew his arm around me, but I didn't want comfort. I wanted an explanation for what I'd seen. You don't know, she said incredulously. I don't know, I repeated, surprised at the surge of anger that came with the words. I didn't ask to be shoved into the fold. I'm not the one who went looking for a fight with the Volcra. Why don't you ask your captain what happened? She's right, Sturmhan said, trudging out of the water and up the shore toward us as he stripped off his ruined gloves. I should have given her more warning, and I shouldn't have gone after the nest. Somehow the fact that he was agreeing with me just made me angrier. Then Sturmhan removed his hat and goggles, and my rage disappeared, replaced by complete and utter bewilderment. Mal was on his feet in an instant. What the hell is this, he said, his voice low and dangerous. I sat paralyzed, my pain and exhaustion eclipsed by the bizarre sight before me. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I was glad Mal saw it too. After what had happened on the fold, I didn't trust myself. Sturmhan sighed and ran a hand over his face, a stranger's face. His chin had lost its pronounced point. His nose was still slightly crooked, but nothing like the busted lump it had been. His hair was no longer ruddy brown but dark gold, neatly cut to military length, and those strange muddy green eyes were now a clear, bright hazel. He looked completely different, but he was unmistakably Sturmhan. 
And he's handsome, I thought with a baffling jab of resentment. Mal and I were the only ones staring. None of Sturmhan's crew seemed remotely surprised. You have a tailor, I said. Sturmhan winced. I am not a tailor, Toya said angrily. No, Toya, your gifts lie elsewhere, Sturmhan said soothingly, mostly in the celebrated fields of killing and maiming. Why would you do this? I asked, still trying to adapt to the jarring experience of Sturmhan's voice coming from a different person's mouth. It was essential that the Darkling not recognize me. He hasn't seen me since I was 14, but it wasn't something I wanted to chance. Who are you? Mal asked furiously. That's a complicated question. Actually, it's pretty straightforward, I said, springing to my feet, but it does require telling the truth, something you seem thoroughly incapable of. Oh, I can do it, Sturmhan said, shaking water from one of his boots. I'm just not very good at it. Sturmhan, Mal snarled, advancing on him. You have exactly ten seconds to explain yourself, or Toya's going to have to make you a whole new face. Then Tamar leapt to her feet. Someone's coming. We all quieted, listening. The sounds came from beyond the woods surrounding the lake, hoofbeats, lots of them, the snap and rustle of broken branches as men moved toward us through the trees. Sturmhan groaned. I knew we'd been sighted. We spent too long on the fold. He heaved a ragged sigh. A wrecked ship and a crew that looks like a bunch of drowned possums. This is not what I had in mind. I wanted to know exactly what he did have in mind, but there was no time to ask. The trees parted and a group of mounted men charged onto the beach. Ten, twenty, thirty soldiers of the First Army. King's men, heavily armed. Where had they all come from? After the slaughter of the Volker and the crash, I didn't think I had any fear left, but I was wrong. Panic shot through me as I remembered what Mal said about deserting his post. Were we about to be arrested as traitors? My fingers twitched. I wasn't going to be taken prisoner again. Easy, summoner, the privateer whispered. Let me handle this. Since you've handled everything else so well, Sturmhond? It might be wise if you didn't call me that for a while. And why is that? I bit out. Because it's not my name. The soldiers cantered to a halt in front of us, the morning light glittering off their rifles and sabers. A young captain drew his blade. In the name of the King of Ravka, throw down your arms. Sturmhan stepped forward, placing himself between the enemy and his wounded crew. He raised his hands in a gesture of surrender. Our weapons are at the bottom of the lake. We are unarmed. Knowing what I did of Sturmhan and the twins, I seriously doubted that. State your name and business here, commanded the young captain. Slowly, Sturmhan peeled his sodden greatcoat from his shoulders and handed it to Toya. An uneasy stir went through the line of soldiers. Sturmhan wore Ravkin military dress. He was soaked through to the skin, but there was no mistaking the olive drab and brass buttons of the Ravkin First Army, or the golden double eagle that indicated an officer's rank. What game was the privateer playing? An older man broke through the lines, wheeling his horse around to confront Sturmhand. With a start, I recognized Colonel Rowski, the commander of the military encampment at Kubersk. Had we crashed so close to town? Was that how the soldiers had gotten here so quickly? Explain yourself, boy, the colonel commanded. State your name and business before I have you stripped of that uniform and strung up from a high tree. Sturmhand seemed unconcerned. When he spoke, his voice had a quality I'd never heard in it before. I am Nikolai Lansoff, major of the 22nd Regiment, soldier of the King's Army, Grand Duke of Adova, and second son to His Most Royal Majesty, King Alexander III, ruler of the double eagle throne, may his life and reign be long. My jaw dropped. A shock passed like a wave through the row of soldiers. A nervous titter rose from somewhere in the ranks. I didn't know what joke this madman thought he was making, but Rovsky did not look amused. He leapt from his horse, tossing the reins to a soldier. You listen to me, you disrespectful whelp, he said, his hand already on the hilt of his sword, his weathered features set in lines of fury as he strode directly up to Sturmhand. Nikolai Lansoff served under me on the northern border and... His voice faded away. He was nose to nose with the privateer now, but Sturmhand did not blink. The colonel opened his mouth, then closed it. He took a step back and scanned Sturmhand's face. I watched his expression change from scorn to disbelief to what could only be recognition. Abruptly, he dropped to one knee and bent his head. Forgive me, Moisarevich, he said, gaze trained on the ground before him. Welcome home. The soldiers exchanged confused glances. Sturmhan turned a cold and expectant eye on them. He radiated command. A pulse seemed to pass through the ranks. Then, one by one, they slipped from their horses and dropped to their knees, heads bent. Oh, saints. You've got to be kidding me, Mal muttered. I'd hunted a magical stag. I wore the scales of a slain ice dragon around my wrist. I'd seen an entire city swallowed by darkness. But this was the strangest thing I'd ever witnessed. It had to be another one of Sturmhan's deceptions, one that was sure to get us all killed. I stared at the privateer. Was it even possible? I couldn't seem to get my mind to work. I was too exhausted, too drained from fear and panic. I scoured my memory for the little bit I knew about the Ravkin King's two sons. I'd met the eldest briefly at the little palace, but the younger son hadn't been seen at court in years. 
He was supposed to be off somewhere apprenticing with a gunsmith or studying shipbuilding. Or maybe he had done both. I felt dizzy. Sabachka, Jenny had called the prince. Puppy. He insisted on doing his military service in the infantry. Sturmhond. Stormhound. Wolf of the Waves. Sabachka. It couldn't be. It just couldn't. Rise, commanded Sturmhond, or whoever he was. His whole bearing seemed to have changed. The soldiers got to their feet and stood at attention. It's been too long since I was home, boomed the privateer, but I did not return empty-handed. He stepped to the side and then threw his arm out, gesturing to me. Every face turned, waiting, expectant. Brothers, he said, I have brought the Sun Summoner back to Ravka. I couldn't help myself. I hauled off and punched him in the face. 